everyone. Welcome to our talk. How are user JSON deserialization the other day to steal money on the blockchain? I'm Rolly, and my co-speaker Wu Zekai will be present at part two. We are from Tencent Security Xinhu Lab. Our research fields include Android, web, IoT, browser, blockchain, etc. And our Xinhu Lab outputs many outstanding achievements that are by the channel. Here is the outline of our talk. First of all, I will introduce part JSON briefly. FastJSON is a widely used open source JSON parser with 23,000 uh, stats on GitHub. It's known for fast passing speed. There are 3,600 artifacts using uh, FastJSON on the Maven. As a basic module of countless Java web service, it serves hundreds of millions of users. In this part, I will detail the deserialization process and security check in the first JSON and the vulnerability to bypass the check. First of all, there is a demo for JSON serializer and deserializer. Uh, first of all, there is a demo for JSON serialize and deserialize using fast JSON. At the left side, there is a Java bean named user with a string field name name and the getter and setter for name. On the right, new a user object and set name to full using method JSON dot to JSON string with flag serializer uh, feature dot red class name to serialize the user object to JSON string. And you can see the output of JSON. The key add type has value user. That is the class name of the object. And the following is the field name. And then uh, use method set auto type support to enable the auto type feature. Uh, then using JSON dot pass method to uh, deserialize this JSON string to a user object with name four. Take note of this line of code. Of code, parser config set auto type support. Auto type is a very important feature of fast JSON deserialization. It's the flag about whether fast JSON can deserialize any uh, non pre support uh, non pre support classes automatically without uh, other configuration. It's false in default. If you don't enable auto type, method JSON pass will throw a JSON exception about auto type is not support when you pass the JSON with add type user class. Next, I will detail the deserialization process inside the fast JSON. When the scanner catches the token key add type, the serialized uh, process will be started. First, the target class name uh, will be checked by the method check auto type. If the check is passed, method get deserializer will return the deserialization constructor. The deserializer will be selected by the target type. And finally, use the method create instance of the object deserializer to get object from JSON fields. Next, let's focus on the defense method, check auto type, and how to bypass it to deserialize arbitrary classes. Uh, the method check auto type has three parameters. Parameter type name is the target class you want to deserialize. The, you, can, you can specify it uh, explicitly in the JSON. For example, add type user. Uh, the parameter expect class is the superclass or interface of the target class. And it, it can be none. And the last parameter feature is the deserialize flag. It always defaults. Before we start detailing the check process inside the check auto type, we need to know how to input a parameter of type class as the uh, second parameter expect class. As we said, the expect class means inheritance. There are two forms of inheritance in the first JSON. The first one is, is, is explicit inheritance. You can start a JSON object string with two add type key. The first add type value is the expect class, and the second one following is the subclass, which inherit from the expect class, and the fields following are the properties of the subclass. Another form is implicit inheritance. There is a demo. Class user had a field ID with interface form, and the class for import implements the interface form. So you can set the ID to a JSON object with type of type for import. Uh, that will trigger the implicit inheritance. The interface for is the expect class, and the for import is the subclass. 
Go back to the check auto type. This section, I will detail the control flow of the method check auto type and show you how to bypass it. The first line is the function prototype. First, if the target class is in the whitelist or in the deserializer cache, uh, or has the fast JSON and rotation JSON type, it will, it will pass the check. The target class will be returned and saved to the deserializer cache. Next, if not, if the target class is in the blacklist or inherited from a JSON circle row site, data source, or class loader, the method will throw error and uh, exit. If not, if the incoming in parameter expect class is not known and is not those types, object, a uh, serialized ball, clones ball, uh, a clone ball, close able, uh, event listener, collection, and the target class is assignable from expect class. It will pass the check, return, and cache. If not, finally, it can't pass the check unless the global flag auto type spot is true, but it is always false in the default configuration. To intuitively Observe the cases past the auto type check. I list them as follows. First, enable the auto type support flag. It's a rare situation. Next, classes with an uh, annotation JSON type. Uh, those classes are not universal. We can't use them anywhere. Next, classes in the whitelist. Whitelist initialized as a final static hash code list. Uh, with about 60 classes which are mainly related to Java Abstract Window Toolkit and the Spring Framework. Those classes in whitelist and at high level, uh, which are not easy to be, ex uh, extended, to be extended. So the first three cases are not our first choice for bypass. Next, uh, classes in the deserialization, uh, uh, in the deserializer cache, uh, the last one, the second parameter of check auto type is back class and the subclass of it, of it. Especially note that the expect class is a parameter with type class instead of type string. That means the expect class has already passed the auto type check. It's converted from string type name to a target class. So the source, the source of expect class are the classes in the uh, whitelist and the deserializer cache. So we focus on the deserializer cache. The cache is named tab utils mappings. It's initialized in the method tab utils at base class mappings for preloading the deserializer of basic tabs. At the right, it's a part of source code. You can see the class byte, int, boolean array, class object, and the interface clone ball are added to the cache mappings. Although there are many low-level class and interface in the cache, uh, those types have their own specified deserializer. Uh, for example, class is, uh, exception and class error will handled by throwable deserializer. Uh, class hash map and hash table will be handled by map deserializer. Uh, but except the two types, Java util bit site and Java long auto closable, for the JSON, we will create a default Java bin deserializer for them. So, uh, any classes extend B side or auto close ball can bypass the auto type check and create an extended family. So, we can inherit from those classes to bypass the auto type check. And auto close ball is a very low level interface since JDK 7. It's the super interface of the most of stream classes, channel classes, and the connection classes, etc. The picture at the bottom is the uh, sub-interfaces and uh, implementing classes listed in the JDK document. Those classes provide us with a broad search space uh, to derive our guardian chain. So finally, we bypass the auto tab check by Java long auto closed able. This is a poke for the bug. A JSON string with two add type keys. The first one is the expect class auto type uh, auto close ball, and the second one is the target class Java IO reader. 
because reader inherit from auto closable, so it will pass the check. In the previous section, I detailed how to bypass the security check by auto closable. In the next section, I will detail how to find some interesting guides to achievement uh, to achieve remote code uh, execute, uh, execute and more. Now we need to find out which classes we can derive and what we can do by those classes. The second question can be described as which method can be called during this realization. Uh, we call those methods magic, magic method. The method create Java bin deserializer is the main process of deserialization. And inside it, the main method of creating deserializer is Java bin info build. The parameter is the target class and type. First, in this method, it will select the constructor by the two method get default constructor and the get creator constructor. The order of choosing constructor is as following. After constructor, PostJSON will uh, iterate and call all the setter methods of the target class. And next, uh, there are some getter methods will be called automatically during the serialization depends on the return type. Now we can answer the first question about the derivation. Uh, except directly inherited from the interface auto closable, there are four cases that the classes will be added to the cache during the deserialization. At first, the class itself. Second, the types of the uh, selected constructors parameters. Uh, next, the types of the parameters of the setter methods, including the types of public field. And the last, a part of the return types of getters. There is a very flexible feature named uh, JSON path in the Fatal JSON. You can use it as an object query language. And what's even more amazing is that you can use it in the deserialization by the token key dollar reference. Following is a demo JSON. The key username has a value with key reference, which is dollar dot user object dot name. The dollar means the root element is the in entire JSON object itself. The user object is the first key, and the name is the field name in the user object. It will call the getter method getName to get the value from the user object. So JSON pass uh, not only allows us to get arbitrary getters, uh, to call arbitrary getters, but also allows us to cross-reference and access their properties on multiple generate uh, instance when uh, when constructing objects during JSON passing. This feature greatly uh, expand our magic method space. There are some conditions for uh, gadget classes. First, uh, it must be derived. Uh, it must be derived from auto closable. Second, it must have default constructor or constructor with symbols. Otherwise, it can't be in uh, extension it correct, uh, correctly. And third, it must not in the blacklist. In addition to those necessary conditions, we also have some quality requirements for gadgets. The gadgets should call RCE, uh, entry, file, read and write, or other high risk effects. And the dependence of gadgets should be in native JDK or in the widely used third party libraries. There are almost hundreds of uh, third party packages used, uh, widely used in the Java EE. And we need to search gadgets in nearly a million classes. It's impossible to pure, uh, to pure manual search. So I write a, a tool based on the reflection to search the derivation of classes space. I rewrite the file JSON deserialization process to check the derivation conditions and create a graph about derivation relations between classes. It's helpful when you reverse the chain from the sync class. And in addition, the tool can search available gadget, uh, gadget classes in the JDK and the specified set of JS. And I crawl and I crawl common third-party libraries uh, uh, from. Women, uh, to, from, 
Maven as input. There is a video shows how it gen generates almost 5,000 classes from the interface auto close ball. At the beginning, the yellow node is the interface auto close ball, and the green node is class JDK natural URL reader. Uh, the arrow and the line means derivation relation, and you can see the URL reader inherited from auto close ball. And then start searching. There are many colors of nodes. Uh, different colors uh, represent different types. The green node is class. The blue node is interface. The pink node is ab uh, abstract class. The purple node is member class. Here are some high-risk gadgets we found in the third-party packages by the tool, uh, such as use Mass Circle Connector to RCE, use Apache Comps IO to read and write files, use Jetty to SSRF, etc. I will detail the gadget's Comps IO read and write files in the next section about exploiting the blockchain nodes. There are some fast JSON payloads to use JSON Connector to RCE. Due to the difference between versions and the limitation of blacklist, you need to use different gadgets for different metric versions. Now we can control many important uh, websites and affect millions of users by the JSON vulnerability. Let's make more. Uh, let's let's make let like, make things more interesting. We found that this JSON vulnerability affects a public chain with multi-billion dollar market value. And we will detail the RCE on the server node of blockchain Tron is next. Tron is a public blockchain with a native crypto. Uh, currency known as TRX. The max value of TRX is $5 billion and it has 14 million holders. Besides, 1,400 of the apps are on the Tron network with a daily transaction volume of over $12 million. And the Java Tron is the Java implementation of the public blockchain protocol launched by Tron. It analyzes all the decentralized applications in the Tron ecosystem. It's an open source Java application with 2,000 stars on GitHub. Uh, Java Tron can enable HTTP service on the Tron nodes to allow users and developers to interact with the uh, blockchain. We will detail the Java Tron in the next section. In this section, we just need to know it's a HTTP service using faster JSON to pass JSON Post data. Now we have a vulnerability can RCE or read and write any file on the uh, con on some conditions, but those conditions are not always met. First of all, there is no remote JDBC driver in the Java Tron, so we can't use the gadgets of mass circle connector, and there are some problems need to be solved for exploited by read and write file uh, gadgets. The Java Tron is an independent Spring Boot Fast Jar, uh, so we can't write a web shell directly. We should think about what to write, and the jar can run with uh, arbitrary user with network permission. So we should think about where a write ball pass, uh, and the Java Tron using fast JSON to decode the post in the HTTP API requests. However, there is no direct response by HTTP but broadcast on P2P network. The HTTP response just only shows the state of uh, the state of uh, API request. So if we read uh, read files from server node, how to get contents written? Furthermore, the blockchain is decentralized uh, is decentralized. It is decentralized. Uh, that means you take over more nodes, you get more control of the blockchain. So our exploit should rely on as few preconditions as possible. There are some common uh, there are some common ways to get shell on the Spring Boot Fast Jar. Uh, when you can write file, a uh, write file. For example, you can override system libs or write class file in the JVM class path, such as uh, Char set jar. But as I said above, root permission is not required. 
Those file, uh, files can only be overridden uh, by root. And the overriding system of JVMlib is dangerous without the exact version. There is a feature of GNI in the J package. The binary library files need to be released to the file system before it can be loaded. Uh, this operation is usually in the static block triggered when the class is loaded for the first time. And the binary library is always released to the directory uh, specified by the system property uh, Java IO temp directory. And the Java method system load will load the GNI SO file by function dr open. So or writing the GNI SO file will be the first choice. Java Tron used the level DB as the local storage driver for blockchain data. LDB is the first key-value storage library and is used by Bitcoin. Therefore, it's inherited by many public chains. LDB saves the blockchain metadata with, uh, which needs to uh, pull in frequently for reading and writing. So Java Tron uses the GNI driver. As I said, Java needs to extract to extract a GNI library. Level DB GNI extracts the ISO library in the method library extract and load. It extracts the GNI ISO file to, uh, with a random suffix to the temp directory. So, if we want to override the GNI ISO at runtime, we need to get random file name extracted by the JA. The most directory the most direct way is to list the temp directory, but we don't want those information to be broadcast on the P2P network. And the last problem is that we need to write binary bytes instead of a uh, string with, co with coding. There are two things that can cause, can cause coding confusion. The input JSON is read as a string with encoding instead of bytes, and the output stream and the file writer should use bytes. We finally solved those problems by the gadgets of Apache Commons IO. This gadget chain can be compared with other classes to not only write but also read a file. Let's start with read file gadgets. Uh, read file gadgets. It's more clear. Look at the left side. The class Commons IO input boom input stream inherits from auto close ball, so it can bypass the auto type check. It has three parameters in the constructor. Input stream delegate, boolean include, and a variable parameters of class type order mark uh, booms. There is a getter method for field boom in the boom input stream. Get boom will call the delegate read. Uh, we can set the field delegate to the class comments IO input uh, T input stream. The method read a T input stream will write the input bytes to the field branch. The field branch can be set to an output stream in the constructor. So using the class columns IO input, uh, columns IO boom input stream, we can choose proper input and output stream classes to achieve read, uh, read file. For writing encoding stream, we can follow those gadgets just in the columns IO package. Uh, set the source input stream field input to char sync, uh, char sequence input stream and set the field CS to the input stream which you want to write to file. And set the output stream field, uh, field branch to writer output stream with class uh, file writer with encoding. As for writing binary bytes, Besides Apache Comms IO, we need to use two other packages in the Java Tron. Set the field input of in T input stream to, com uh, to Apache Commons codec binary uh, base, uh, base 6 for input stream, which input of read is string and output is bytes. And set the field branch of boom input stream to Eclipse internal local style save file output stream, which is from expect 
Next, this is how to use Apache Commons IO to read files. The entry of gadgets is also the class boom input stream and its getter method gets in boom. It calls uh, it calls method matches in the get boom. The method matches will iterate the field booms and compare every boom with the by, uh, with the best read from the input stream delegate. If there is one boom is the same as the best read from delegate, it will return the same boom. Otherwise, it will return none. So that, uh, so that will let us get the read content according to the different written states. It's a way of blend read. That is a payload for reading the temp directory to get a random file name. First, look at the number one at the right side. We use the class JDK natural URL reader as the input stream. The parameter URL uh, support file scheme for a folder and a listing directory. The number three, the field booms is set to multiple bytes blocks to be compared with the reader output. And the number four, use JSON pass reference dollar dot abc dot boom to call the getter method get boom of the object abc uh, which is the first field in the json with the class boom input stream as number five let this reference wa reference value be the field address and send this json post data to the java Tron api wallet uh, validate address and if the address is none it will read nothing if the address is a bad format, it will return validated field message. So we can use Apache Commons IO to read the temp directory byte by byte, and finally get the random file name of GNI library. Now we can all read the uh, GNI library at runtime. The last question is how to hijack pointer. Uh, the Java Tron will register a timer task for level DB write on initialization. The method dbwrite will call the GNI method native buffer GNI malloc. So we can inject shellcode to the offset address of GNI malloc. When the timer task uh, when, the, when the timer task is it, it executed pong. This is the form process of, of exploit. And the last step is recovering the program context to uh, prevent the crash. And for the sixth step, post penetration for real money. Uh, return to my co-speaker Wu Zekai. Next, I will introduce a post penetration exploit method that affects the security of blockchain user size. After we successfully RCE on Tron's HTTP node, we need to type whether it will cast losses to the user's size. For the blockchain, the first approach we think of is a 51% attack. A 51% attack is an attack on blockchain by a group of miners who control more than 50% of the network's mining hash rate. Attackers with, with majority control of the network can interrupt the recording of new blocks by preventing other miners from completing blocks. And Tron use the super representative mechanism. Any account can apply to become a super representative candidate. Every account can vote for super representative candidates. The top 27 candidates with the most votes are the super representatives. Super representatives generate blocks, package transactions, and get block and voting rewards. Therefore, we need to RCE an at least one half of the super representative nodes to cause a 51% attack. But the actual situation is somewhat unexpected. Not all nodes have an HTTP service enabled. In other words, we can't attack all nodes of Tron. This picture shows the location and IP of all the nodes of the Tron network. This data is provided by the tronscan.org website. As shown by tronscan.org, Tron has 1,332 nodes in total. We scanned those IPs and found that only a quarter of the nodes can be accessed through the HTTP service. Therefore, there is no guarantee that more than half of the super representatives have enabled 
HTTP server. Unfortunately, we can't use this vulnerability to cut the 51% attack on the troll network. We need to find another way. Now let's focus on the Tron HTTP node itself and study what role the HTTP node plays in the Tron network. The Tron HTTP node has a variety of API calls to allow users to interact with the blockchain. Some of the API calls serve as a standalone request to get the individual pieces of information. The most important thing is that there are also many API calls which modify the user TRX wallet resulting a need to sign and broadcast the transaction. We mainly, we mainly focus on the second type of, of, of API. This API will be used when user trade on the blockchain. When the user wants to send some TRX tokens to other users in the Tron network, three steps are required. First of all, the user needs to make a transaction and can call the wallet create transaction API to compare with that. The HTTP node will return a row transaction in JSON format. The second step is to sign the transaction. The user can call the wallet get transaction sign API. The, API. the HTTP node will use the private key provided by the user to sign the row transaction. The last step is to broadcast the transaction. The user can call the wallet broadcast the transaction API. The HTTP node will will broadcast the signed transaction to the blockchain. Therefore, after we are the HTTP node, if the user uses the HTTP node to make a transaction, we can return a further transaction, which will be executed after the user signs and broadcasts it. If the user uses the HTTP node to sign the transaction, we can steal the user's private key. If the user only uses the HTTP node to broadcast the transaction, it seems that we can only prevent transactions from being broadcast to cut US. Obviously, stealing private keys is more harmful than forged transactions, and forged transactions are more harmful than DOS. In the Tron network, almost all users use wallet programs for transactions. Tronlink is firstly launched at Tron's official website and backed by Tron Foundation. It is the Tron wallet with the most users. Tronlink has three versions, including Chrome Wallet extension, iOS, and Android. Among them, Chrome Wallet extension alone has more than 300,000 users. After testing the three versions of Tronlink wallet, we found that all three wallets use HTTP nodes to broadcast the transactions. In addition, Chrome Wallet extension also uses the HTTP nodes to make transactions and directly signs and broadcast the transaction without checking the return to row transaction. So we can try to attack the wallet by returning for the transactions. When the wallet sends a request to make a transaction to the HTTP node we control, we return a for the transaction. Then the wallet assigns the transaction locally and finally broadcast the signed transaction to the blockchain. We recorded a video to demonstrate this attack method. First, the victim trips normally, and Alice sends 100 TRS token to Bob. After that, the attacker executed the exploit program and successfully RCE the HTTP node and, and run the malicious program on the node.
the victim made the transaction again. And the attacker returned the fourth row transaction. Finally, the attacker received TRX tokens instead of Bob. The tag is not over yet. Let's think about it. Why can wallet extension have different behavior from iOS and Android? After analyzing the source code of Chrome wallet extension, we found that it used the TronWeb library. TronWeb is to deliver a unified, seamless development experience, experience influenced by Ethereum's Web3 implementation. TronWeb uses the TronWeb dot trans transaction builders builder.centrx method to make transactions, which will request HTTP nodes. As you can see in the source code, when calling this method, the wallet transaction API of the HTTP node will be requested to make a transaction. We realized that the Tron Web library would be a key point, so we investigated a variety of Tron related applications and made some new discoveries. We found that in addition to Tronlink Chrome Wallet extension, some multi currency wallet and, and DEX also use the TronWeb library. And we also didn't check the road transaction returned by the HTTP node. Multi currency wallet is a wallet that supports multiple cryptocurrency transactions. MToken is a multi, multi currency wallet that supports a Tron. MToken has 12 million users and it uses the TronWeb library. After testing, we found that when mToken wallet generates tron related transactions, it does request the, the HTTP node. As you can see in the picture, we successfully forged the return transaction, replacing two addresses with another address, and then find and broadcast the forged transaction. DAP is a computer application that runs on a distributed computing system like blockchain. As of December 17, 2020, 1,400 dApps have been created on the Tron network, with a daily transaction volume of over $12 million. For a developer, dApp is a combination of front-end and smart contracts. Tron provides Tron wipe for front-end developer. Take a Polynex dApp as an example. When TRX token is sent in this dApp, they will request HTTP nodes to make a transaction. We also successfully forge the return transaction, replacing two addresses with another address, and then sign and broadcast the forged transaction. In summary, the Tron Link Chrome Wallet extension with more than 300,000 users, the Tron, the Tron part of, of the MAM token multi currency wallet with 12 million users, and the DEX with a daily transaction volume of over 12 million will all be affected. Finally, we make a conclusion. Also, distributed and decentralized structure improves the credibility and the fault tolerance of the system. Blockchain is not a bullet proof to security vulnerability. And we hope our work, our work can notify blockchain developers and users to be more careful about security. Our research on the future of blockchain security will include traditional web security, cloud and edge computing, and the post penetration exploit. Here is a vulnerability timeline. Special thanks to Song Kai, Zhou Junyu, Liu Huiming, and Yu Yang. Thanks.